<laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone. And uh, many thanks to uh, Klaipeda University Professor Vitaly Jdenisov and, uh, and Mindogas Kermis for coordinating this webinar and for, for introducing Omega Technology. Uh, my name is Giovanni Di Noto. Um, and just to give you a bit of background on, on myself, I've been uh, uh, for the past 35 years, I've been involved with uh, several hundred projects. Uh, across a wide range of industries and technologies, uh, including uh, mainframe, wide scale cloud infrastructure, uh, ERP systems, industrial blockchain, uh, and quantum uh, computing across three continents. Um, over the next 90 minutes, uh, you will hear about cybersecurity from real world uh, uh, industry professional, my colleagues here in Omega. Um, you will hear about what the, the discipline entails and uh, we hope that this will inspire many of you and uh, and support your your professional choices moving forward. Um, so without any ado, I'm, um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, talk about uh, uh, what we're going to cover, right? So the talk will articulate around five sections. We'll uh, briefly set the, the scene in our preamble. We'll talk about uh, uh, Omega a little bit. We'll then dive into the cybersecurity topic, uh, looking at the discipline from many perspectives. We'll further dig into automated software testing, explaining why software quality has a significant impact on security. And, uh, and we'll talk about the latest trends in this area. We'll then explore the topic of business continuity and disaster recovery management. Uh, and we'll conclude, uh, as Mindogas mentioned earlier, with, um, with an open panel discussion. So by all means, if you have any questions during uh, the webinar that uh, pop in your heads, please do log them uh, in, uh, in the Q&A, in the chat room, and, uh, and then we'll address them during the, the panel session at the end. Um, so first of all, uh, let us uh, provide you with some background on who we are and then what we do and how we operate. Um, the Omega Group of companies celebrate this year its 30th anniversary. Uh, we've got 22 subsidiaries around the world and uh, our, our job is to provide personnel and, and project capital project management tools to many industry uh, and many government sectors, including uh, energy, construction, healthcare, and other sectors. And, and of course, as software security is, um, is a noticeable, very important dimension of what we do, we also are ISO 27001 certified, uh, so information of security management. Um, our Klaipeda office uh, is uh, located within uh, uh, Klaipeda University campus and we act as, um, as a global technology service provider for the entire worldwide group and, uh, and, and all of its clients. So most employees here in Lithuania have a software engineering background. Many come from Klaipeda universities. Um, we have been and still are in growth mode recruiting uh, both industry professionals, but also university graduates. Um, and uh, uh, irrespective of their provenance, uh, the, the typical journey of an employee in Omega starts with what we call an app frame certification. Uh, so we've got a program to, to, to basically certify the uh, uh, new uh, entrants in the company on our technology. And uh, after their certification, they join one of the five core teams in the company cloud team, technology team, security team, or any of the product or client teams. Um, and, and the way those five team categories uh, are positioned uh, compared to our core technology stacks, but also our client solution, uh, is indeed very, very uh, client centric. Uh, irrespective of, uh, of the work that we do, we, we, we really focus on, on, on our client. In that, indeed, uh, Client-centered, being client-centered, being solution-oriented is, is one of our core values as a company. Um, so that's for the background on, uh, on, uh, on Omega. And uh, of course, what you, you understood with that background is that ensuring both our core product and solution safety is uh, absolutely uh, quintessential and it's part of our culture. 
So let's have a look now at what cybersecurity mean, actually, and what it entails. Um, and just to set the scene in security, I, I will start with this quote from uh, Robert Mueller, a former FBI director. Uh, there are two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. OK, um, and, and really what Robert is alluding to with his quote is uh, the quasi ineluctability, the, the pervasiveness of cyber threats, uh, at least in the current TCPIP digital context. Uh, therefore, the mandatory requirement for, for cyber defense and, uh, and cyber security. Um, let's look at the differences between adversarial and ethical hackers, uh, taking a step-by-step -step process approach to, to the respective disciplines. So reconnaissance, for example, is, is about discovering targets, their security postures, and then any potential exploits, which would then be verified but also prioritized and uh, and this is where you start seeing some first distinction between adversarial and ethical behavior uh, an ethical hacker uh, you know in addition to to, to everything that uh, an adversarial hacker would do uh, an ethical hacker would also look at threats from a mitigation perspective and also from a demonstration and simulation which will help not only uh, materializing those mitigation, but also implement and, and educate software engineering teams about both threats and contingencies. Another common concept in uh, cybersecurity is that notion of black versus white box. Um, with what degree of knowledge of the target systems are hacking activities, ethical or not, carried out? Black implies uh, um, a zero knowledge of the systems, where white implies a full knowledge of, of the target system. And of course, you've got a myriad of shades of gray there between those black and, and white approach. Um, yet another color concept there is that of red versus blue teams. Uh, and to, to take a, uh, an American football, a gridiron, type of analogy, an imperfect one indeed. Uh, uh, red teams play offense while blue teams play defense. OK, so that's not necessarily a good analogy because in grid iron, both teams play actually offense and defense, but it gives you a notion of, a, uh, of that distinction. It also shows you uh, and illustrate that idea of purple team. So a purple team play both red activities and basically blue activity. Um, so by now, you know, you, you, you might start having that, uh, that kind of romantic notion of ethical hacking because I've been using movie superstar and sport legends and rock band musician type of analogies. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the really rules, and we know that since uh, since last year with COVID, we know who they are and, uh, and, and these are the really rules, right? And what I mean with this metaphor is that a large chunk of what we do in cybersecurity has actually to do with cleaning code, okay? Constantly scanning code, constantly looking for dirt in the most remote corner of, uh, of your stack. And, and actually that's real fun, uh, providing that uh, uh, we have the right tools. So speaking of tools, um, uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, the toolbox of, uh, of ethical hackers, um, what are the core ones that we use in cybersecurity? So there's a variety of tools there. Um, an important first category of tools are vulnerability scanners. Uh, there's a variety of commercial and open source ones. Uh, and in fact, it's it's common to, I would say, safer to use more than one, uh, a matter of don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, those tools are, are, are not perfect, you know, uh, known are. Uh, for example, crawling capabilities is a common pitfall with many scanners. So as an ethical hacker, the, the key to circumvent that particular problem is to actually leverage the white box approach that I described earlier and force feed those type of tools with all known paths rather than relying exclusively on, on their built-in crawlability type of features. Um, and even then, uh, irrespective of crawlability feature, 
uh, it's important to realize that many threats, indeed um, half of them, might remain completely undetected. Um, and even the one you detect uh, needs serious analysis and serious scrutiny because you need to weed out uh, false positives. Um, so what this means really is that, uh, generally speaking, you will be developing your own tools in addition, in, in complement to uh, those scanning tools. Um, and so the, the, the coding dimension in cybersecurity goes well beyond hacking alone. Uh, it implies a, an in-depth knowledge of the stack that you are working with, and it implies, uh, uh, at least at a team level, if not at an individual level, uh, a complete full stack professional type of currency. Um, now, beyond scanners and beyond uh, your own security tools, there's many, many other resources, uh, important information resources, you know, such as the ones listed here, and uh, you also need uh, info security type of management tools. So in the case of Omega, we've got a, a great platform called Omega 365 that we use to, uh, to log, uh, to register findings, incidents, to implement mitigation. Um, and then in addition to this, uh, another layer are those hacking framework uh, that you use to actually simulate or, or reproduce some of those uh, vulnerabilities or hacks. Uh, so in a moment, my colleague will uh, demonstrate uh, BIF and DVWA, which are two of the uh, tools that you, you have at your disposal to uh, reproduce and simulate those hacks. But the, the key there is that even if you, you've uh, obtained a, you know, a professional nirvana, even if you are a security master, a ninja, uh, even if you have a compelling toolbox at your disposal, it's still important to note that um, the, the, the scale and the scope of threats is such that uh, um, you, you, you are unable to tackle everything at once, um, especially zero days attacks, for example, where by definition you are unable to see from where the attack is going to come from and how it's going to originate. Um, so, what is important here to, uh, to note is that you, you need to prioritize the work. You need to uh, basically be able to prioritize the threats. And the way you, you, you do this is by having, by establishing actually a scoring system, such as the one showcased here. So you can build your own scoring systems, but uh, uh, you've got many ways of scoring. Here's, for example, a, a possible way of scoring, right? So in this, four level scoring system, any threat directly impacting production system are immediately classified as critical and take precedence over uh, everything else, basically. Um, but we, we, we could use also the CWE top 25 score range uh, to identify and classify those range to stratify those risks. Uh, but of course, if the threat that you've identified is not part of that top 25, well, uh, as a fallback, you could use something like CVSS, for example, uh, calculator to determine the, uh, the level of threat and then reconcile that around your severity levels. Um, so here's, um, as an example, this is how threat categories might be stratified. Um, over the next part of this presentation, we're going to give you a, a demo uh, and tips and tricks of some of those risks, one in each main category, very high, high and medium. Um, so to give you a feel of, you know, how to work, but also what type of mitigation uh, do you put in place against those threats? Um, and this will not be a, a, an exhaustive type of demonstration, but provide you with um, a bit of a platform to explore beyond that webinar, uh, other type of threats. So, on that note, I will now hand over to my colleague Vitotas, who's going to explain and demonstrate what uh, uh, cross SS threats are. And Vitotas, I will ask you to present yourself also to, to, to our audience. So without any ado, take over. Thank you, Giovanni. Hello, everyone. Let me introduce myself. My name is Vitotas Daniela. I studied business information systems in UK, which eventually led me to 
quality and security area. I work as a security and automated software quality testing engineer at Omega. So let's talk cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. Cross-site scripting risks come in different flavors, stored, reflected, and DOM-based. Stored XSS means that an attacker has access to a target system and can inject compromised code at that level. The malicious code is then served by the actual server. Reflected XSS. The attacker can social engineer the victim to make a request to the server with injected code. Following the request, the response from the server contains the malicious code, hence the type name reflected. DOM-based XSS are very similar to reflected ones. The main difference is that the malicious script is kept at the client side without sending it to the server. The requests and responses are clean. The malicious code is injected into the DOM at the client side. Cross-site request forgery is an attack that forces the end user to execute unwanted actions on the web application in which they're currently logged in. Unlike cross-site scripting, this attack utilizes functionality already built in the application, like credential altering or other sensitive data theft, modification or destruction. So let's talk reflected XSS attacks. In this demo, I will play the part of the victim and the attacker. For the demo, we will be utilizing B framework from exploitation and uh, for exploitation and damn vulnerable web application as a vulnerable system. On the left side of the screen, you can at the moment see the panel for the B framework that we will be using and the damn vulnerable web application as a vulnerable system. So let's log in as the user. We're currently logged in. And the right side will be used as the hacker's perspective. So here, as you can see, we're not logged in, but we're going to be hijacking the user session in a moment. So we craft an a social engineering email with a malicious link and send it to the actual victim. We send the link, the user clicks on it and becomes compromised. Gotcha. So we see that the victim's browser has been hooked. Now we can use the session as a proxy. You use it as a proxy and this separate browser will be set up to communicate through the proxy. Okay, the proxy is set up. Now we can check if we can access the user session. Great, we access the user session. Now we can have some fun. So let's change this user's password and lock him out. Quickly, we make the request. Okay, the password has been changed and we log the user out. Now the user unsuspectedly clicks somewhere on the menu and he sees that his session is over. He tries to re-log in and he sees that his 
credentials have been compromised. So this concludes this small demo. There's a, there is a lot more that you can achieve utilizing these tools, and I encourage everyone to do some research. It will help make the web a safer place. Back to you, Giovanni. Thank you, Vito Tass. I'm just going to share my screen again. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, OK. Um, all right, so many thanks for, for the demo, Vito Tass. That was uh, quite compelling, of course. The, 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 the cross SS uh, uh, part uh, was uh, the, the hijacking itself, but once you, uh, you, you, you've you changed uh, the, the login and the password, but the, the, the key there is that you can do uh, uh, many, many other very, very damaging things, right, from, uh, from then on. So uh, many thanks for the demo again. Uh, another type of risk, uh, scoring less than the cross SS risk that we just saw, but still in the category of a uh, uh, high uh, uh, type of risk is a uh, SQL injection, which also come in, in different flavors, right? So in the same way, we have different flavors of uh, cross SS. We have different flavors of SQL injection, such as comment attacks, uh, stacked query attacks, div by zero attacks, union poisoning. Um, and, and the one of interest really to us, which by the way is relatively easy to mitigate, uh, but is still a particular area of focus for cybersecurity team is uh, what we call second order injections. So the, the reason why this is uh, particularly important for us is because the, the SQL injection attack can be fed directly from a web UI or a browser URL, uh, and that makes it particularly uh, dangerous. Uh, but of course, easy to mitigate providing that uh, the right sanitization and validation layer uh, is in place. Uh, so that's uh, um, an example of, a, of of some of the SQL injection risk there that you can uh, you can face. Um, now stepping down to to a lower level, but also uh, as a mean to to grant uh, the conversation there on what those severity level really mean. I want to talk to you about a particular. Uh, risk, uh, which is third party library. So that would be classified as a medium uh, level risk, of course, but uh, let me give you an example of a, a 23 million euro damage example of what a medium level risk might turn into if not properly managed. So um, the case study that you have in front of you is uh, quite recent, August, September 2018. Uh, what happened? Well, the, the case is with British uh, Airways. 380,000 credit card details uh, got stolen from British Airways uh, over a period of a few days uh, toward the end of August up to the 5th of September. Um, all, of, uh, all of this because of one exploit on a third party library, which was hosted not in British Airways systems, but actually in a CDN, a content delivery network. Um, now, the outcome of that breach, 23 million euro fine for British Airways uh, because of uh, the GDPR breach. And of course, the losses in market trust and brand value are certainly worth much more than this. I would argue uh, uh, in the hundreds of millions of euros. Um, so, What's particular about that incident is that that single incident could have been completely avoided by implementing a simple SRI, an integrity attribute, in the script declaration for this particular library. Um, of course, that SRI was missing, and of course, that was the way the attackers penetrated those systems. Um, What's also interesting uh, with this case is, uh, and, and worth clarifying, uh, is really the, the role of CDN, the role of those content delivery network. Um, you know, historically, CDN uh, companies like Akamai at the beginning of the millennium introduced that type of uh, infrastructure to uh, basically enhance the performance of web application where the user base geolocation was difficult to uh, to determine, right? So typically B2C type of application uh, where you do not know where your user might be located. And so CDN, in the case of a 
British Airways, for example, is completely warranted because it's it's a B2C website, it's a B2C application, and their user base is uh, arguably dispersed and, uh, and and very, very distributed. But in many other cases, um, especially with B2B application, CDN are not necessarily justified. Uh, in fact, they even might prove to be detrimental to the app performance. So this is a case of a what we call, you know, uh, loose programming or lazy programming. So what, what I want to, to say there is that often uh, a mitigation is not necessarily a, a straight answer, right? Uh, there might be architectural consideration that you need to look at and before to jump too quickly to a, to a solution. So in the case of BA, yes, it was a, a mistake, you know, that SRI was missing and that costed them uh, that that middle medium level severity problem costed actually uh, hundreds of millions. Um, okay, so in in terms of a best practice and focusing really on the, on the app side of things, right? They, there are many many other type of threats. You know, we just wanted to give you a, a small snapshot of uh, uh, some of those threats. But in so far app development is concerned. Uh, a recurring top security advice uh, would be sanitize, 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 and sanitize again, right? Validate all your inputs. Do not trust anything that comes from a browser. Even if you've got validation routines at a, at a JavaScript level on the at a browser level in place, well, redo that again at server uh, level, right? So sanitization is, is, is incredibly important. Um, and, and of course, that, uh, that range of tips that uh, we're giving you here, uh, that's just for the security of, of, of the apps, right? The apps level. Uh, but there are, you know, uh, uh, basically a range of mitigation strategies there, which, uh, which is as vast, if not even wider than the, uh, the threat range, the threat categories, as you, you can see here. Um, so what I will now do is I will hand over uh, the rest of the presentation first to my colleague uh, Lucas, who will talk uh, about uh, why software quality is another important security measure. Uh, and Lucas will then be followed by uh, uh, Thomas, Thomas Kaminskas, who will talk to us about DRM and business continuity. So different other type of mitigation. Um, so without any any due, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, Lucas, take over and uh, and talk to us about automated quality control. Yeah. So as mentioned, uh, my name is Lucas. I'm actually a fellow student in Cleveland University. Uh, I've been working with Omega for my first year, so it's almost been two years now. Uh, started with manual testing. I'm now part of the security team, and I'm going to talk about. Uh, what we used for a long time, what we are still using uh, for software quality control, it's automated testing. Uh, and I think the point that uh, I'm going to be driving home is software quality is indistinguishable from security. These two uh, don't only have a correlation, they have a direct causation in between them. So uh, with software quality control, you the first the very first thing you have to realize is that quality strengthens security and lack of it weakens. And you might be thinking of, hey, does it really make sense? I mean, if I have firewalls, security, all of the secure frameworks implemented, how quality can weaken security? It's question to deep diamond, but uh, to put it in a lame, uh, layman's terms. If your code, if your code from code's perspective, this is not uh, of top notch quality, it it will introduce security flaws in the long run because you're going to have to maintain it during maintenance. There's going to uh, be loopholes in it that appear. These loopholes can be exploited directly or the uh, cross-site scripting, CRSF, uh, as uh, Vito just showed, where somebody else can exploit it to, for their ill gains, 
or it can uh, introduce just accidental information leaks where, for example, you use data from a different data set that you intended and oops, on accident, I leaked all my user information data when I was just trying to show a user's profile. Now, that the reason, uh, with that reason, uh, you, if any of you paid attention to the marketplace for jobs, uh, in the last couple of years, the testing part uh, of the whole programming world has grown a lot. It has there's a lot more companies searching for uh, actual testers, both manual and automatic, and this is the main reason we see, uh, we, uh, that we can see for the fact that a lot of more companies are getting hacked now is the reason why a lot of co more companies are ch searching for testers. So when we are talking about testing, what can we do? Well, there's a lot of tools that allow for automated testing. Uh, most prominent are functional testing when you test the functions themselves and it's UI testing. For example, Selenium Suite allows us to test UI. Uh, and what UI testing can give us is make sure that the buttons that we need are working correctly, that no incorrect data is being returned and that the application looks as it should in a specific user's context. So there's, of course, a variety of tools. There's open source, there's paid ones, but uh, a best uh, the best example that is free and fast is probably the Selenium suit. So some of you might have heard of Selenium itself. Uh, we specifically, not specifically, I'm mentioning Selenium IDE that utilizes web drivers for specific browsers. So it acts sort of a, like a plugin that is able to record uh, different actions that you take. So when it records them with the IDE, it is able to represent them uh, in a step-by-step -step manner. And once you wish, it can recreate those steps. Now, once I have a tablet, a phone, and a computer, and I want all of them to work with my app perfectly, I would probably utilize the grid, which allows for me to act as a main hub and just point to each device and say, run this app, run this test, run this project. And basically it's a distribution of work that allows us to parallelize different testing uh, projects basically which does not only speed up testing, it also differentiates it where it's different parts are being tested individually. So you ensure that all the areas that you need are covered. It does that mainly by recording JavaScript, other projects, other solutions use different uh, methods. For example, we have worked with a tool that used C Sharp and worked as a Windows application. Selenium works just at, for recording JavaScript and it's an easy U, web app UI tester. So to, of course, show off how functional it is, let me run you a quick demo. So I'm opening my Selenium ID, which once again is a browser plugin. So this is just between my plugins. So I open it up, I create a new project, and then it asks me for a base URL. So I'm just gonna copy, paste in a URL I can use. Uh, and basically it's this way it knows what application you're testing. So when I click start recording, it's actually gonna open up the application. Now, I can press outside of the browser window anything I want since it's not JavaScript, so it's fine for me to open up. But once I click something that's inside a web application, like the username, it's gonna know what, uh, that I clicked on it by searching the HTML element tree and picking out that specific element, which you'll see later. So for now, I'm just gonna enter the username, uh, just created a specific user for this presentation, enter the password. The password is being logged as well. Gonna log in, it loaded up, and I'm gonna log out. Clean as that. So I open, open up the Selenium back. Remember, not in browser, so clicks aren't recorded. I will stop the recording and it's gonna ask me for a test name. So just gonna type in presentation one, let's say, 
saved. And over here, we can actually see all of the steps I took, which aren't many, but enough. So it logged me in. Then it found the uh, place to set in my username where it wrote it out and it found out where the password was stored. So keep in mind, passwords aren't uh, aren't hashed in Selenium since it has no way of knowing uh, which, uh, which field is a password or not. It basically is a key logger for, uh, for your specific use case. Uh, then it probably logs in, clicks the button I clicked and then logs out. As you can see, it, uh, it click, the last step is to click on the log out button. So it actually is pretty fast. So if I run it now, it opens up the browser, prepares it, enter, enters everything one by one, goes in, clicks and logs out. It's that quick. It, quick, simple, easy, no problems, right? Well, uh, you can adjust even speed if you wish to, so I'm just going to make it a little bit that slower so we can see, see it in full action once again. So when it's preparing, it's basically rendering its own JavaScript uh, file that it then, as a plugin, it can use onto your websites. And basically, as I said, since it had collected each element with their specific uh, specific HTML settings. For example, it can use XPath, it can use uh, the name attribute, the ID. It's really, it it allows it for to traverse the whole HTML DOM and find very specific fields, buttons, anything you need very fast and be able to use them as a normal user would. Now, once that's done, you receive that, hey, everything went fine. Uh, in case one step would fail, for example, maybe when the, the user didn't log in, it actually threw him an error, then he wouldn't be able to click on the la logout button. This way, the Selenium ID would immediately say, hey, stop, this is an error. You would, as a tester, you would just see, hey, this test failed. You would be able to investigate it and report it. And now that once that's done, uh, you might think to yourself, uh, hey, that's easy, you know. It's just clicking a few buttons and that's it. Like I record something and I get paid. Where do I sign up? But in reality, the tester's job is a little more complex. It's not just clicking buttons, recording events, having in run while you're sipping coffee. You actually have to be able to know. You have to always talk to the product teams and people who are developing the apps. You have to dis uh, distinguish, do you need a testing environment? So something that is separate for development. Most of the times you do, because if somebody is developing an application and you're testing at the same time, you do not know if it's if it broke because the application is broken or was the developer actually testing that something at that exact moment. You also need to know exactly, sorry, uh, you also need to know exactly what, you, what you're testing. So you need to, the main key, key process list, you need to know what data sets you're using, and it just becomes this bureaucracy uh, that you keep as logs of what you have covered for tests, what you need to test out more, and where do you grow as uh, a testing unit maybe. You also need to be able to roll back anything you change. For example, if I was going in with that user and creating maybe another user, just testing out if user creation works, I would need to go back in and delete the user that I, uh, that I created in the test. Because if you don't, you're going to clutter your database and data sets, and you're going to have a lot of bad time cleaning it up. There's also, uh, the fact that you have to be able as a tester you have to be able to run the tests in a very specified time if you need to run it every week but your tests take two weeks to run because you are uh you haven't developed them in a proper way you haven't scrutinized you haven't refactored the, the tests it's not gonna work if on most of the time testing is done so when uh, developers deploy their product when the client receives the product the product works if you're unable to test in the time it needs for the product to reach the client it it's not going to work out so you tests have to be ran in an agreed time 
And after they ran, do they pass, do they fail? You have to check out and read out false positives. So for example, uh, maybe the tests themselves have been broken. And if uh, there's anything true, so for example, you actually find a bug, maybe the user couldn't log in, maybe a button was broken. Uh, you normally log the findings, raise it with the product team, with the developers, tell them, hey, we cannot push this to deployment. There is a critical functionality that's broken and uh, we cannot send it to the client. So everybody's sharing, right? It's easy, it's quick, clean. You just set up an environment, make a list, write a test and go free home, right? The tests are running, you sip the coffee, you go home, you go to work next morning, you see everything ran fine, 10 thousands of tests and you just deploy to client, right? It's how the market represents it, but in reality, it's far from it. In reality, you're gonna be, when you think about testing, you think about, hey, if the test broke, I might need to fix the app. But the reality is, if the test broke, 90% of the time you have to fix the test because the, the app is still working correctly. It's just uh, just that your test is not up to date. So in the testing process units, it's uh, when you're writing automated software testing units, when you're writing te these tests, you have to think about the long longevity of them. You have to think, uh, hey, how will I maintain this? You have to think about, how much resources are you going to commit and what are the actual critical processes that I need to dedicate those resources to? If you don't have an actual framework for this, if you don't know the tools well enough, and if you're just as most of uh, junior developers do, just go with the flow, do everything I need for this day and tomorrow's problems are for tomorrow's me, it's not going to work in the long, uh, long term. It's a headache, and I know that from personal experience, where a bootstrap a library change broke 70% of tests, and you go in and you have to fix every and each one of them. But is it a good practice? Depends. It is, uh, by the market, it is looked uh, with a keen eye right now. It is being scrutinized, it's being looked after, and it's possibly uh, the future. I, I really think it is. If you be here to rethink it, it's empowering engineers to be, to be able to test themselves. It's I maybe sometimes you don't have to have a specific person to write a test. Maybe engineers can write themselves too. Uh, I create a new functionality. I write I write a test for it. So it's about distributing the work. It's about uh, having each developer be responsible for what they create. Thus, going back to the quality of code, where each developer thinking about how they're going to test it, need to make sure it has the quality it needs to be tested correctly. You also need to work on the design because if you know you're going to test it, you need to design it a better way. You need to design it to be user friendly. Uh, you need to be able to look back on the stack you have you need to be able to refactor the functions so they work together with the new updating uh, updating of tests and as mentioned you need to know what are your critical process and be able to also look uh to the broader perspective of the security behind them now speaking about broader security thomas is gonna talk to you about cybersecurity. security uh, thomas if you may yeah thanks lucas Okay, so uh, short introduction of myself. I am Thomas Kaminskas, team lead at uh, cloud team uh, at Omega 365. Uh, 20 years in IT, uh, went full stack from networking to Linux administration to cybersecurity and currently in the cloud. Have worked for the Claypedo State Seaport Authority and Claypedo NAFTA. And after that, I joined the Omega team where we are currently. So my presentation today will look at cybersecurity from the infrastructure point of view. Uh, and specifically about cloud. Uh, so I mean, that's the usual question. What is cloud? And as you can see, the cloud is 
Linux servers mostly, of course, Windows as well. Um, but as a software engineer, you must understand that your code will run for sure in the cloud in the future when you deploy your apps. That's uh, that's the existing trend already. The most uh, biggest uh, popular services are already running in the cloud, like whatever you are using the Android devices, all of those servers are, are running in the cloud. Uh, and we have this, um, you, you can choose between on-prem running uh, your services it, at your own data center, or you can choose the cloud. And as you can see from the examples, uh, it looks obvious that you would want to choose cloud because the on-prem infrastructure might have various accidents and uh, might be maintained poorly. And uh, the cloud uh, infrastructure is uh, secured physically. It's it's uh, well managed. You know, you have seen all those um, nice videos of overviews of data centers at Facebook or Google or Amazon. And um, so it looks like no brainer. You should go to the cloud, but um, uh, you should care be careful with your decision and my presentation will be about uh, the use cases uh, in the cloud and we will try to see what can go wrong there. Uh, the cloud engineer, what uh, it has the broad uh, range of, of skills and, and areas you need to know, going all the way from the networking to virtualization and uh, database management. So basically, a lot of skills you need to have and to understand and today we will just uh, be focusing on security and recovery as the main topic is cybersecurity. so we'll, we will be looking from that point of view and specifically disaster recovery uh, how it's related to cybersecurity. disaster recovery is a process tools and policies um, of uh, business continu continuity. How do you enable recovery of your service or continue providing it when some natural or human induced disaster happens? And as you see from the slide, you should do better than just shouting help. You should have these policies clearly defined and, and uh, tested yearly or, or, or whatever the period. Some theory be before going into the into the use cases, uh, what's RPO and RTO? Those are two specific terms which needs to be uh, understood and uh, clearly communicated to your clients and uh, to your team. So basically, when disaster hap uh, happens, that we see the event uh, clearly defined as a disaster, RPO is recovery point of objective. So that blue dot shows that that's the last backup we have taken and we have available. And uh, what's the time you are tolerating that data can be lost? And RTO is recovery time objective. So basically, what's the time you can tolerate that your service will be not served until you restore your last backup? Those terms shall be clearly understood that uh, uh, you can recover from the disaster. And uh, going uh, further, now we will look at the three use cases. So the first one, it just happened at uh, March 10th of 2021. The one of the biggest uh, cloud providers in Europe, OVH, got uh, their data center on fire and it was uh, destroyed uh, in totally. Uh, a lot of customers, bigger and smaller companies, also A-list companies, banks, uh, government agencies, uh, uh, Rust game developer, that's, uh, they had all of their services running in that uh, data center. Uh, especially uh, using the bare metal servers. 
that means that all of the data was there. No backups were produced in the, in in the in the some other physical separate location. So all of the data was lost. Um, and the lessons learned from that disaster is that you you as a service provider you must understand your infrastructure and your data like you you need to know where your data is uh, where your service is hosted and where are you mm, producing the backups uh, you must understand uh, these metrics like rto and rpo so that it's not just theoretical uh, meaning but uh, how come you how can you restore your uh, your service and how long will it take and as an example here you are you are not able to restore the service because the data was gone uh, and yeah the the, the main and uh, important part is that the back backups needs to be redundant and um, you need to test and revise the disaster recovery planning every year so can you recover your data if it's lost from the main site? And the second case happened uh, closer to us. So that was uh, July of the last year, 2020, when the big flood fl rain flooded the um, uh, Registro Centro data center. And the data center was uh, hosted on premises uh, in some underground facilities. So uh, that's a, an example of natural disaster, uh, which uh, caused uh, huge services to be set offline, like e-health, uh, notary couldn't work, uh, electronic signatures were not working. So it, it, the, the, the artifacts were really huge. And um, the main lesson here is that your service, if you are running this high profile service, it needs to run in a high availability mode. So the servers should take uh, should take over the, the, the backup location. Uh, and the third use case, that's the not natural disaster, but that's the cyber security incidents in its uh, highest form. So. Um, the CTB, the famous car sharing service, they got hacked and uh, the data of 110K customers got leaked uh, online. Uh, and uh, from the public sources, it looks like um, that was caused by misconfiguration in the cloud. So the storage account was configured to be publicly available and uh, the database backups wasn't encry encrypted so whoever got downloaded those backups they could read the data um, so that's an example of uh, just because you are hosted in the cloud doesn't mean you are secure you need to make sure your your infrastructure is being maintained and and uh, checked up uh so that's it that's uh, the part of the cloud giovanni back to you many thanks for the presentation first of all uh, uh, both lucas and uh, and thomas and um, it's time for the panel discussion so i'm um, I, I would like to to also invite uh, uh, minogas and uh, and see if uh, if we have any any uh, questions from uh, from the, the the audience first of all or, or um, we had one question from the audience, actually. OK, OK. Uh, concerning Selenium ID. Uh, so the um, the audience asks uh, if it's possible to use Selenium ID for basically dynamic web application, front end web applications that use like React or Angular. Probably we can uh, throw in Flutter and uh, Dawn JS for similar times that basically are rendering dynamically uh, and the answer is yes I double check Google right now uh, so since it's rendered as an HTML dome uh, selenium should be able to pick up any element there uh, with my 
experience with React and Angular, you have to set in specific keys for really, really dynamic elements. Otherwise, most of them are still rendered the same way. Uh, Vito does though did raise a good uh, point saying that uh, some elements, if you don't assign a key, they might be uh, rendered with a different key each time you reload the app. So Selenium won't be able to recognize that these are the same elements as you clicked when recording. Uh, so to ensure that, once again, we go back to the quality of software, which is if your element that should have a key doesn't have a key, that's a quality issue. So Selenium will also probably help recognizing these flaws in the web application as well. OK. Vito Tas, you, you, did you want to maybe add uh, some uh, or provide some other element or additional element of answer to to Lucas points? I think Lucas uh, comment was on point. OK, um, all right. Um, now, do we have any other question from the audience? And if we don't, uh, I might probably uh, 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 pop up a question to well, to all of you actually. Uh, uh, guys, what what keeps you awake? Uh, you know, uh, at night. I mean, I'm sure you all sleeping very well, but is there a particular area of uh, cyber security or beyond cyber security in the IT industry that uh, that you know? Um, are of a particular focus for you or, or particular interest or do you foresee you know uh, some uh, some area of it uh, basically uh, um, coming up and emerging thomas can i can i uh, ask you to to maybe start with uh, and, yep. and provide us with some comments on that what um... Uh, what's uh, what I see as a really interesting trend in the future of cybersecurity is the machine learning approach. Uh, that uh, that that is a really hot topic. Uh, how the machine learning will help resolve various issues uh, and various threats that are uh, targeting us. So that that's that's the one. That's the most interesting to me right now, and I think that's the future. Do you do you already use in in the area of uh, of uh, cloud infrastructure management some of those tools or or, or not yet? Uh, not directly, but for sure, I think we use because you read use cases of Microsoft Azure uh, using uh, interesting uh, machine learning approaches to to tackle issues. And we as a client uh, of Azure, for sure, are using this. OK, OK. Well, let, 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 let me ask uh, maybe another question for, for, for everyone, which is uh, oppositely, wh wh what are you passionate about in the job? You know, what is it that, uh, that gets you out of bed in the morning? What, what is it that drives you to actually uh, do what you do every day? Uh, Let's start with uh, Vito Tas. G give us some uh, some insights on uh, on on uh, on your passion for the job. Basically, what are you passionate about in that job? Well, that's a really good question. Um, well, from the security side, it's really fun to find vulnerable spots that someone else missed, and finding some ways of exploiting those things are well basically that's really fun as long as they get fixed <laughs> okay lucas what about you yeah uh personally i'm very no knowledge hungry so with every day coming to work i try to seek out something new to learn uh even developing simple applications sometimes i push myself to try out new concepts try out new algorithms so it's always that uh, constant need to learn and expand the knowledge i have even within security context uh, 
like I went through the trouble of reading each line of APIs we have just so I could learn about APIs themselves, not only test out for security. So that's mainly my drive is just to get in there, do stuff, learn stuff, apply myself basically. Uh, I like very much that that knowledge angle that you are introducing because, and we we might come back to that. But uh, t -t Thomas, I, what, what about I, you? Yeah, I could add the same. To, I could add to Lucas' comment that uh, probably that's why we all chose IT because it's a constant uh, desire to learn something new, to try some new technology, to to try to check some innovations happening. So for sure, that's the main driver in IT in general. Okay, well, keep, keeping on with that theme, right? Because that, that knowledge uh, aspect is uh, is quite important, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm conscious that we've got an audience today of uh, of students uh, who are still in a or, or in an academic type of settings. But uh, what kind of uh, insights would you would you provide, you know, to uh, to to people who might not be yet in a professional context? And uh, and and the reason I'm asking that is because you we we all talking about knowledge, and you know. What comes to mind uh, personally is uh, um, you, you you graduate and you think you you've achieved something and you did, but it's really the beginning of a journey, right? Which is your knowledge uh, uh, journey is actually just starting, right? Uh, uh, and I know that uh, every day for the past 35 years I've been learning and I keep on learning every day and I look forward to learn something, but. Do you guys feel the same? Is this the is this the type of insight you would provide to to an audience of uh, young students who are about to start their career? Lucas, let let's start yep. with you because you you've got kind of a double <laughs> life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm like Batman or Spider Man, any superhero leading one hero life at a job and uh, posing as a normal student uh, during the day, you know, uh, but. Speaking realistically, uh, university has been a quite big help in uh, actual uh, development work. And I think some students do uh, will have that notion of, hey, I finished the university, but I still don't know nothing. I have, haven't had actual practice. I haven't had any way to apply myself. Uh, but in reality, it's the fact that you hadn't had the way to apply yourself it's you, you have the knowledge the students have the knowledge they just haven't had a chance to apply themselves they haven't chance had a chance to learn what they want during university time you just do, go through the curriculum and you learn everything that's thrown at you meanwhile if you if you fellow students you search for the job you apply yourself you're gonna find more intrigue in it than you might actually realize and the knowledge you actually gained through the years is very applicable. I wouldn't have told you that uh, knowing what how a list changes from a stack event that I learned the first year would benefit me in any way, shape or form. But during the very first months, I already had a chance to flex my knowledge against uh, colleagues and just because they didn't know what stack, stack from a list is different from. And I mean, most of the developers are, might forget, they might uh, not be concerned, but the fact is that you as a new person, you're always bringing something to the table and it doesn't matter what job applies, uh, you're applying to yourself, but IT is a very specific case because you're bringing a new perception. You're bringing a new way of looking at things and most likely you have looked at other stacks than the one you will be working with. So you're able to, uh, <laughs> give a different opinion and not by learning the stack that you're working with, uh, be it Omega or any other fellow company, by learning our, our stack, you're able to see both the benefits and gaps in it. So that's what, so you don't need to be afraid that, hey, I don't have the knowledge, I don't have uh, the development skill is needed. That can, that can be given as long as you're willing that can appear you're gonna learn you're gonna develop the skill just understand that you're you're an asset and you're bringing something to the company v vitalich did you did you want to add uh, some some uh... <laughs> yeah uh, actually uh, thank you lucas yeah, very very good uh, summary <laughs> nice to hear about stacks and lists and data structures 
Uh, but actually, the whole computer science uh, field is the field of uh, lifelong learning. So you always need to be in the process of learning. And so my my question, uh, even if I know the answer, so where to start for uh, for everybody? So what should be the first step for students to be involved and uh, to be motivated? Uh, and to be updated with not only with new technologies, but also with conceptual background, with new concepts. Hmm. Mm. Um, any anyone? I, I might take a, a, a bit of an answer there, and I will invite uh, others to to respond to that. But uh, you know, the, the the way that that question is formulated, what come to my mind right now is that, of course, it's. Uh, lifelong learning experience, but I think one of the most recent dimension to that lifelong learning experience is actually about how do we unlearn? How do we uh, declutter uh, out of our knowledge what is no longer necessary? Because, uh, you know, what, for example, a full stack developer might have meant uh, uh, at, at the end of the last century or the beginning of the millennium, is, is quite different today. And, uh, and the reality of full stack developers is that well, they, they probably no longer exist or if they exist, they are a pretty rare species because the scope of knowledge is such that trying to learn everything is, is nearly impossible. So my, my, my answer to what you just asked would be probably uh, be, be clear on, on the direction that you want to take. You don't have to embrace everything at once, but uh, be, be extremely clear on what are the domains that you're going to need to know uh, in terms of uh, the, the career choice that you're going to make. Uh, keep in mind that those career choice might evolve over time. You know, along your careers, you're probably going to change five, ten times domains or professions. And so it's pretty important to maybe <laughs> Uh, know at actually what are you passionate about now in the immediate future and what type of skills are you going to need there? Uh, so that would be my, my recommendation to a junior, uh, uh, younger type of generation. And I would add to this that soft skills are very important. So rather than hard knowledge, learning how to learn, learning how to unlearn, and then a variety of other soft skills such as you know communication and uh, and 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 uh, uh, people care and and uh, uh, you know especially communication are, are particularly important right how to work as a team um, so that would be my I know it's a bit generic but that would be my my advice to to younger generation I would say know what you want know what you're passionate about and then narrow down the scope of the skills you're going to need uh, and do not forget soft skills because they're very, very important. But that's my view. W what are your views, guys? Thomas, well, Lucas, well, Vitotas. Well, yeah, I'm pleased to hear about soft skills. It's sometimes it's uh, underestimated, by my opinion. Yeah, so uh, main attention is put on technology, but not on uh, social development and psychological development. And so one way probably it's to start from personal cyber security. So you can start from your personal working place, making it secure uh, and then going to the application development and, and so on. I would also like to add an analogy. Well, programming and IT is the size of the, the, the topic, the general topic is the size of an ocean. And during your careers, you will be probably drinking a few bucket loads of it. But don't let that discourage you and never lose your thirst and then you'll succeed. Hmm. Uh, I could see we also have another question in the QA and a panel. Uh, so Giovanni, I'm going to rework this and you actually, since you're the team manager, this is probably best for you. Quality and security. If I can spend one hour a day for quality and security, what should it be? Any recommendations? Who? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
do, do you know, I, I want to come back to some of the foundational tips and tricks, especially the organizational one that we we've discussed uh, during the, the, the webinar. And, and that is uh, you need a, an operational framework. You need to be prepared. You got to have the set of right tools. So the one hour a day will work well if you've done all that preparation work before. If you've got the foundation correct, do not build the house and don't maintain the house one hour a day if the foundation is broken. So the, 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 the one hour a day could become something incredibly trivial and, and smooth as long as the foundation is correct. And the, the correct foundation is, I repeat, uh, right prioritization, right threat scoring, right operational framework, automated one, you know, in so far quality is concerned. My, my view on your question is that if you have only one hour a day, that means you're pretty busy doing something else. And so automation and enhancing your own personal performance with robots, because that's what automated uh, software quality, software control is all about. And then, and, and, you know, security scanning, uh, having the right tools is very, very important. So spend time, uh, as, as I often say to, to, to anyone in the team or anyone who want to listen, the more time you spend on designing, not just designing the software solution, but designing your operation, designing your operational framework, the more time you spend on design, the smoother and, and uh, uh, the leaner your operations are going to be. So one hour a day could be as simple as checking your news feed and checking your uh, uh, scrutinizing your findings that the jobs which are running overnight have been doing for you. So put to work your robots, but to do that, you actually need to have the right foundation. Um, what, what do you think, guys? What, what well, Thomas? Yeah, or, or yeah, I just wanted to add in to, uh, that, uh, especially in my part, I did say start security and quality. They're not correlated. They are causation of one another. So when you have your code and you're thinking, hey, do I go for quality or security this time? I'm going to ask, how are you differentiating? If you're looking at code anyway, I mean, strive for quality. Within that quality, you're going to achieve security or vice versa, strive for security. And that way you're going to achieve quality. These two are impossible to be separated unless you're talking about, as Joanna mentioned, uh, robots, but then you already know that your code is pitch perfect as it is and you're going more for, hey, does it not break along the way? Uh, but overall, yeah, from my perspective, it's inseparable. So Thomas, what's your perspective from cloud? Yeah, I can only add for Giovanni's comment about uh, robots doing the work for you. It's all going uh, automation way, infrastructure as code. So, because uh, the human element is always adding something like, you know, personal, some small bug, some personal touch. And when it's defined in code and version control, then it's, it's, it's always deterministic behavior that you will see. I would add that. Vitotas, what are your view on this? I'm thinking the human element, right? Put your put your devil advocate type of uh, type of heart there, and uh, is it all about automation? Hmm. If the foundation uh, if the foundation is correct, then the automation operations would run smoothly but is it first of all you should focus on the actual foundation and design of the operations as you said previously but even then the, the reason why I, I was asking that uh, specific question to you is as you know uh, take, take those uh, vulnerability scan for example type of tools right which are the, the, the ultimate in terms of a uh, uh, robotization of uh, threat detection and, and, and penetration testing. And yet we know that they're not perfect, right? We know that that uh, human dimension, scrutinizing the findings and weeding out uh, false positives, uh, um, 
we, we, you know, even machine learning is not yet uh, at a level where it can do that for us, right? So, um, the, the, when we talk about automation, it's really important to understand that robots are here to empower humans, as opposed to that notion that those bots are going to replace, you know, humans. I, um, I don't. Uh, I don't want to, to, to kill that possible future, but, but the, the reality of today is that it's all about empowerment uh, and it's all about productivity, really. Uh, how can you do more by actually leveraging the robots around you, but how can you do more as a human? And so it's back also to those soft skills that we were uh, mentioning earlier, right? And uh, um, Definitely. yeah, so that, that would be uh, my a good point would be the 80-20 rule uh, and don't try to write the tests yourself and test everything. Uh, think about developing empowering tools for the engineers. Unless you're the engineer. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope we've answered that, uh, that questions. Um, uh, I yep. can see there's another question in there uh, that Wadim has answered, uh, but maybe you, Joanna, want to elaborate a bit more. Uh, so an audience member is asking, do you have open positions in Omega for a junior IT guy with just some knowledge? Uh, we, we, we've got, a, well, I, I see that uh, Vadim has been uh, answering already uh, to that yeah, specific just, uh, question, but, uh, ju just to, uh, to probably to answer to that, as I mentioned earlier, the one of the uh, uh, mandatory pathway. Uh, we, we first of all we are recruiting permanently, so that's the we are in growth mode. Omega is uh, is an organization which uh, which is growing. You know, uh, uh, COVID has been practically uh, uh, neutral in so far our market growth is concerned. So we constantly looking for for new resources. So that's number one. Uh, but the, the pathway to, to an Omega job in, in, in the engineering section is really that upframe certification program. And one thing that we do, uh, and, I, and I'm trying to answer that just some knowledge type of aspect, is that we open our upframe certification program not just to people who already have uh, uh, high skills, but you know, we've got summer internships, summer traineeships. We, we are really open to engage with uh, uh, junior resource or people who do not have yet uh, knowledge and prepare them to actually uh, uh, that path. So my, uh, you know, my answer would be contact us. You know, uh, get in touch and, and let's have a chat. And uh, and we had, you know, we had an example. I can think of a recent example where uh, someone approached us and we realized that the SQL skills were not um, deep enough, you know, uh, for us to uh, push on with a relationship. And so we we did not stop that relationship. We actually uh, describe a possible pathway toward uh, being ready to undertake an upfront certification. And and that person is about to to, to restart that again in a, in a, in, a, in a few days. So. Um, so no matter what, engage with us. Let's have a chat. Let's have uh, a conversation. Yeah, so it's not just, you know, you come in, we say, uh, we check out your resume, we say no, get out, you your, no. your, your have a lack of knowledge. You come in, we see, we see your potential. Uh, I haven't, but uh, managers do. They look out for you, they see your potential. You're assigned most of the time a mentor that's there to help during your certification program as well that can be asked questions that can help you look uh, help you out with specific topics where you need to look what you need to learn for example both me and Vedas are the perfect examples of that we took more than a half a year to actually pass the certification program uh, i know i started at early uh, march finished at late summer and throughout that i, I came in without any sql knowledge barely a programmer newbie but throughout I learned I asked questions there was back and forth back and forth some fate was put into one another but Omega is a company that isn't here to employ most perfect programmers that don't make any mistakes it's here to help developers grow along the way Omega is a company that grows their own strong base of developers and that's what you probably want to aim for. It's a company that helps you grow 
as well as being able to apply yourself. And uh, I think you know uh, uh, probably a best way to 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 do that is uh, is get get in uh, if you can see that screen. Go to our website and uh, and and basically uh, uh, you've got a, a talent section there where you would be able to uh, to you know uh, uh, register and uh, get in contact with uh, with us and 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 take it to take the conversation to a, a next level, right? Now I see that there's there's another question there. What is the best functional testing robot? in the industry now. <laughs> hmm. So, uh, sorry, Lucas, Vitotas, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> uh, I'm going to I'm going to yeah, start. Very, okay. a very, very but, difficult question. Yeah, there's uh, a, a long, there's a variety of tools, commercial and, and open source. So the, the, uh, the question is not simple in the sense that first it, it's going to depend on your stack it's going to depend on what you need to to test uh, what, what is the type of application is it a web application is it a win application is it a responsive hybrid application with mobile dimension etc etc so depending on the nature of the stack some testing tools are going to be adequate others might not be uh, it might be a variety of tools that you need you know uh, then there is a question of budget. Um, do you want to go open source? Do you want a, a, a paid solutions? And uh, the budget is not just about the licensing. It's also about the scale and the service level agreement, the SLA that you are going to have uh, with your own product teams or your client teams. So now you might think you 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 I am answering generically. I am not. What I'm saying is to define a proper solution um, is not only about the particular features uh, of your testing tools. It's really about uh, understanding what is it that you're going to test and in what conditions those tests are going to need to run. So you might have the best commercial tool in the market, and yet uh, the implementation of that tool, uh, there might be budget constraints or there might be timing constraints, or it might become uh, uh, so costly that actually the cost doesn't justify the implementation or vice versa. So it's not a straight answer. You know, um, uh, the reason why we presented Selenium is because Right now, in terms of open source solution, I would say that this is the most popular, probably the, especially the latest version of the Selenium suite, which is what uh, uh, Lucas presented earlier. Uh, it's not, it's not bad, but it is really about browser-based testing, about web application. If you need to test mobile application or Win applications, Selenium might not be the solution for you. Um, Lucas, do you want to add to that or was uh, so you know the f best functional testing robot? Uh, very heavy question. Uh, personal answer is Google because in Google you can find out any information you need, what you need to check, what needs to be uh, verified, what are the security flaws in any web application. Uh, but speaking about robots, it's just like choosing a, your stack. Either you go with what you know or you go for what's the best uh, appropriate that something that has the needed functionality. Like even within our security team, we use a, a lot of robots, like we even write our own tests. So it's we, we use robots, robots in the sense of applications that help us scan. So we use uh, we used Selenium for UI testing together with Ranerx, another tool that uh, used C Sharp. Uh, we used Zab Detectify, which are vulnerability scanners. So the uh, Giovanni had a slideshow about it, where basically they crawl to your web application, they get all possible links, all possible APIs, and then they try to do something malicious with them, seeing if they're vulnerable or not. So that's th those two, only those two, are very different things. And if you tell me which, if you ask me which one is the best robot, I mean, neither is best because they serve different functionalities. It's like comparing a room, but that's on the floor with your ceiling fan. You know, it's it depends on what is the purpose that you seek out for. 
And really, as Giovanni mentioned, you also have to look at the resources, how much time you have, what's the scope of the project, and do you really need a robot that's already prepared? Maybe you, what you are aiming for is actually much better to be built yourself. You know, maybe it's a database scanner. Maybe you just try to write yourself a few automated scripts that you run and check that the database is uh, still in perfect shape and nothing is broken. So yeah, uh, my answer is just as your money, it depends. And but the point you have to make for is what do I want? That's really going to tell you what is the best testing robot. Tom, Thomas, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering. Oh, sorry, did I? Uh, yeah, I was, just wanted yeah, to you, add that there's no silver bullet. Uh, all of the robots come with their own limitations and problems. Um, I would say search for the best solution for the given task and don't uh, limit yourself to one particular suite. Um, yeah, so no silver bullet and stay skeptical. <laughs> Thomas, I wanted also thanks, Vitotas. That was, you know, a good good answer. But Thomas, you've been across along your career different environment, right? A, a .NET, Microsoft environment, Linux environment. Is there also beyond uh, the type of tools we've presented, all the tools, you know, that you that come to mind when uh, when we think in terms of automated testing? You know, mm -hmm. often we we focus just on. Uh, on, on the application side, but you know, you've got other aspects like yeah. load, peak testing, etc. What are your views on, on, on that, on automation and, and best tools? My biggest, uh, biggest areas was still the physical infrastructure. And uh, uh, it wasn't like uh, at the app level, it was mm. more like a physical infrastructure level. But still, I can relate like uh, having the automation tools in the bigger network that can uh, I can run a bot and it can find my network device which is hidden and can show me the full physical path to it. Uh, it was all these lifesavers. And uh, again, the same story as here. The, the first investment, the and not just investment in money, but investment in your time and energy and knowledge uh, the initial the the learning uh, curve is steep at the beginning, but after that, uh, when you when you have uh, it live in your network, that was always a lifesaver. So, uh, parallel story, the same story, just in different area. Okay, I can see that there's two other questions there. Um, so first question, is it possible that it can be too much security? Can uh, it decrease efficiency of project business? As example, privacy policy too strict and it's decreasing efficiency of website. Um, well, per personally, I, I would say no, you can't, you can't have enough security, right? Uh, but uh, um, the, and the reason for that is, is really what we started with, right? Which is, we're living, unfortunately, in a in a in a in an environment which is highly pervasive, and not only pervasive, but you've got new type of threats which are emerging every day. So I'm not just talking about zero days type of uh, type of attacks, but uh, um, situation where you might find yourself. And when I say you, I'm talking about any company, including juggernaut companies okay uh, uh, i refer to public cases like uh, uh, ibm or hp over the past two years where uh, they found themselves becoming collateral damage in uh, cyber wars of a geopolitical nature which had nothing to do with them um, i'm referring to situation in ukraine in uh, in hong kong in us where uh, entire vital infrastructure especially in the energy sector was deliberately targeted, not for conventional type of uh, uh, hacking, you know, uh, but uh, a new type of hacking where you've got state level actors which are uh, incredibly uh, uh, powerful and resourceful. So I, I would say that from that perspective, uh, no, you cannot have enough security actually, and, uh, and, and that whole area of security is going to increase. Now, you mentioned compliance and um, and again, I, I refer to what I said earlier, right? Which is the more time you spend on design, 
the more time you spend on establishing the right foundation, not just technical foundation, but you know things such as uh, governance matters and compliance and code of conduct and uh, security of information and uh, and ISO certification. Yes, those things might seem bureaucratic and and for me it would be wrong to take actually a bureaucratic uh, uh, angle to them. What you need to do is actually embrace them and 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 extract from those seemingly bureaucratic type of process actually the real meat. So make them alive, uh, establish security as a culture, as opposed uh, to, to, to a, just a bureaucratic process. Uh, because if you ingrain this as a, uh, uh, really at a cultural level on your organization, then you will thrive. You know, you will, uh, you will be secure. So, so that's my personal opinion based on my experience, not based on opinion actually. Uh, uh, I've been working for some of the largest companies in the world and you know, with some of the best security team in the world, and uh, you know, because that was the approach, we never had a problem, and we were under attack. Okay, uh, I'm talking dozens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of attack attempt every single day. Okay, well, the best way to protect against that is is really to to have security, to live and breathe security at a cultural level. Um, now, can it get too strict? Can it decrease efficiency? Yes, if you adopt the bureaucratic process, you know, if you do not embrace security and compliance and governance at the cultural level, then yes, it can become an hinder your process. Uh, but if you build that cultural dimension, if your engineers own security, if you don't centralize it, but if you distribute it across the entire organization, then it's um, you know it's you 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 in business basically, uh, so that would be my 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 answer to to that to that question. It's a good question, um, guys. Do you do you want to add anything on that or from your perspective? You know, I think we've been talking about the engineer Vitotas. You were mentioning engineering empowerment, and uh, and it's really what I'm talking about here, isn't it? Yeah, kind of. Um, from my perspective, yeah, there's not too much security. <laughs> <laughs> there can't be too much security if it's taken the right way. Uh, and we live in a dangerous you could, world. You could you could uh, drive the point of hey, if I have to check security on each API call. Uh, it might t uh, prolong the API call by like three, four hundred percent, making it unusable. But at that point, look at your design. Why does your design make you execute four, four, five hundred percent uh, more than it would? Like, look at the design. Look at how your security is structured. Restructure it if needed. Security isn't uh, once set live it for long if your product grows your security has to grow too your security has to expand together with the product so it's not just uh decreasing efficiency of a website it's increasing it actually it's more secure as your user if as your user i want my information to be secure i if i have to wait uh five milliseconds more when i make an api call so be it but if you have it structured in a way where I log in and it takes 20 minutes for me to load my page just because you're checking my permissions. I'm more worried about your design than your security or quality, really. So I think it all comes down to design. It's not possible to have too much security. Thank you for those answers, guys. There is a second question which uh, and we had an element of answer there, so I'm going to share with the audience uh, and it's a very uh, very interesting question because it uh, it it's more complex than we think, right? The question is, have you ever been hacked in Omega? Okay, and I'm going to explain to you in a minute why why I think it's a much more complex question than we think. So the answer, first of all, is yes, we've been hacked. 16 or 17 uh, years ago, a school student uh, took over our servers. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm reading uh, that the answer, uh, and it never happened after that. And for me, the <laughs> the conclusion of that and where I want to, to, to push on with that question a little bit is 
you do not learn you if you do know. not make mistakes. <clears throat> mi mi mistakes and errors and, and uh, going through those difficult time is absolutely essential to acquisition of knowledge, uh, not only individual knowledge, but organizational knowledge. So mistakes are actually a, a, a good thing as long as we make them once. If we make mistakes or if we see repeat mistakes, that means that as a knowledge organization, we do not know how to learn and, and that's a problem. So we need to, to tackle that. And, uh, um, but you know, we need to embrace that, that notion that mistakes are not bad. Mistakes are the way we learn, okay? Uh, and I know that in other area, that's, uh, that's the way I've learned and sometimes very, very painfully, right? I remember my uh, beginning in, in e-commerce and then uh, at a time where fraud prevention did not exist at all as a discipline and we had to establish that from scratch. Why? Because, well, we learned the hard way. We got stolen things, you know? Um, so it's the same in security. You know, if you, uh, Robert Mueller, you know, I mentioned earlier, Robert Mueller, director of FBI, there's only two types of company, those who have been hacked and those that will be hacked, you know, uh, that, that's the reality. So for me, that question relate to knowledge. Okay, you do not learn if you do not make mistakes, but you should make mistakes only once, which is if you are a good knowledge organization, if you architect it properly and you embrace governance, not as a bureaucratic process, but as part of your culture, then those mistakes will be digested. We will learn from them and we will get stronger. And this is exactly what happened to Omega 16 or 17 years ago when uh, they got hacked. They never got hacked again. Now, this is not about bragging. You know, uh, humility is, is part of our uh, uh, it's one of our core values, you know, in Omega, and uh, and this means being constantly aware that something big could happen, and we need to prevent that and preempt that. You know, uh, uh, one of our job in 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 the security team is actually not only to monitor the security situation constantly, but actually to try to prevent and and be particularly aware of those. Uh, daunting and very, very challenging zero days attack. You know, uh, how do we develop processes to uh, basically uh, be prepared when those zero days attack are going to eat us and where we won't know from where it's going to come, right? So, so that's one of our core, uh, core function right now. Um, it, guys, do you want to add anything to 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 this to these questions on that topic of a uh, learning experience and learning knowledge and learning organization? Okay. Well, it seems like we we reached the end. So, Vitaly Mintogas, we, we we would like to thank you again for the invitation to present today. That was a uh, uh, great. Thank you for coordinating that event and. Uh, um, do you want maybe to conclude with uh, with some la last words? Yes, thank you very much for a really inspiring uh, event, uh, at least for me, I hope for students as well. And uh, for me, uh, Omega technology or Omega uh, 3, 6, 5 uh, is really a very good example of uh, how students uh, became professionals and it really makes me feel good. So uh, <laughs> our job also makes sense. Uh, and uh, to become professional, you need an environment. It, it seems to me that Omega, it's really uh, environment where you can flourish and you can develop yourself and uh, uh, also uh, be uh, a part of so nice team. So thank you very much again. Uh, I think it was very interesting, useful. Of course, too many questions still, uh, <laughs> still are somewhere. Uh, and uh, again, the topic I just uh, touch is the soft skills. I think what we need here is uh, critical thinking. And coming back to one of the questions, there is no such a thing as the best software Ever or, or something. So you need to you know, evaluate it from different points of view, 
formulating different criteria, what fit for the purpose, and etc. etc. Um, but again, uh, I also agree that uh, you should make mistakes to learn <laughs> because you need some. Uh, of course, you need some data for any kind of learning, but you also need some noise uh, uh, and then make all these uh, statistics employed there. Uh, if we think of learning processes, statistical process. Uh, <clears throat> again, many inspirations, but uh, thank you very much again. It was really very interesting and productive. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, Mindogas. Did you did you want to add any anything? Yeah, so I would also like to thank you for the very very good uh, webinar. Uh, I think it was really interesting for our st students as well, and for me it was uh, very interesting. So uh, I think this is one of the first uh, this kind of public webinars, but. I hope so. It's not the last one. Yeah, and uh, we would be very happy to see uh, more of, of the teachers from your company who could come as teachers for our students. Yeah, so uh, we have some examples and maybe we can expand this more. And there's um, a lot of to learn for the students and for us, especially for us. Yeah, so students now is smarter than their teachers. So we have the, the best opportunities now. The summer is coming, so students may ask for the practice uh, in the companies, not only the Omega companies, but in any companies, because like I say, for, for our students that uh, some experience even uh, working as I don't know uh, in a shopping center is better than no experience when you're trying to apply yeah because you are developing your soft skills which professor uh, was talking about yeah so and uh, the hard skills the technological skills uh, is also very important but you but they're changing so fast that you need to adopt it because in the first course, the most popular language may be uh, not used anymore in your the last course. So you need to learn how to Google. Yeah, like someone said today. <laughs> yes, this is one of the most important soft skills of today world. So I would like to thank again, and it was really oh. interesting and. Maybe we could see this year or or we will see in I don't know September. Yeah. And we'll continue this our discussions. Yeah. So everybody will be after a vacation. The students will be full of energy and we will start making something new. So now good good luck, yeah, and I hope to see you all soon in in live, not this kind of live, yeah, but in in real life. Yeah. <laughs> right. so. Okay. Well, listen. Many thanks for your your insights, and I'm sure the conversation will uh, will uh, will go on beyond that uh, webinar. Many thanks to the presenters uh, today for for their preparation. Yeah. And uh, on that note, I think uh, we can close. Many thanks to the audience for the very interesting questions and for for being there today. And uh, I think we can close this event.